Daf Yomi, Tractate Bovakama, page 106a, top of the page, with the words Be Picadon, Pasul de Edus. One who denies a claim concerning having, having taken a deposit is disqualified from bearing witness, because if it is clear that the deposit is in his possession, yet he denies it, he must be lying. The Gemara raises a further difficulty with regard to Rav Sheshet's opinion. But didn't Ilfa say that an oath affects acquisition, meaning that once he testified falsely that he did not become a bailey, the item in question becomes his property, rendering him liable as a robber, even for damage or loss resulting from accidents. The Gemara infers it is the taking of an oath that affects acquisition, but more denial of having become a bailey does not affect acquisition. The Gemara rejects this distinction here too, Ilfa must be referring to a case where the deposit stands in a place not in the Bailey's possession, for example, swamp, and as long as he does not take an oath, it can be assumed that this that his intention is simply to be evasive. But if the animal was standing in his house, then he acquires it as soon as he denies the claim. And if you wish, say instead, what is the meaning of Ilfa's statement that an oath affects acquisition? It is in accordance with the statement of Rav Huna. As Rav Huna says, that Rav said, that if one party says, I have 100 dinars in your possession, and the other party says, you do not have any money in my possession. And the latter took an oath to that effect. And the latter witnesses came and testified that his oath was false. He is exempt, as it is stated, the oath of the Lord shall be between them both to see whether he has not put his hand unto his neighbor's goods. And the owner thereof shall accept it and he shall not make restitution. Exodus 22.10 Teaching that once the owner receives an oath, the one who took the oath no longer pays monetary restitution. Ilfa's statement that an oath affects acquisition means that the bailey will no longer have to pay monetary restitution, and it does not will no longer have to pay monetary restitution and does not relate to Rav Sheshit's statement that the bailey becomes responsible for damage resulting from accidents as soon as he denies the claim. Having mentioned Rav's ruling, the Gemara addresses the matter itself. Rav Huna says that Rav says, if one party says, I have 100 dinars in your possession, and the other party says, you do not have any money in my possession, and the latter takes an oath to that effect, and later witnesses came and testified that his oath, oath was false. He is exempt. As it is stated, and the owner thereof shall accept it, and he shall not make restitution. Exodus 22.10 Teaching that once the owner receives an oath, the one who took the oath no longer pays monetary restitution. Maybe because he already has a higher punishment? Like a cum labor drabine kind of thing? Anyway, Rava said, Rav's statement is reasonable in the case of one who denies having taken a loan, which is intended for expenditure. Since the money is no longer in his possession, the Torah exempts him from monetary restitution. 
restitution once he takes an oath. But in the case of one who denies having accepted a deposit, it remains in the owner's possession and it must be returned intact. And it is not considered to be monetary restitution. Rava continues, but by God, Rav said, that's very strange. Why would the Talmud say Veha Elohim? But by But this is very this must be a code. I have to crack this thing. Rava continues, but by Hashem. Rav, Rav said his statement, even in the case. I mean, why did he why did he have to do that? Veha Elohim. There must be something to that. I don't think it's just plain. But who can decipher this code? God, would you reveal me this code? Why are they saying Vaha Elohim right here? Why? But by God, Rav said his statement, even it doesn't sound right just to say, to evoke God's name just in mundane. This must be something. Rav said his statement, even in the case of one who denies having accepted a deposit, as when this verse exempting him from payment is written, it is written in the case of one who denies having accepted a, a deposit. Doesn't make a lot of sense to me. And anyway, at any rate, the Gemara relates that Rav Nachman was sitting and saying this halacha. Rav Achabar bin Yumi raised an objection to Rav Nachman from that which was taught in the Mishnah 108b if the owner asked the Bailey, Where is my deposit? And the bailiff said to him, it is lost. And the owner said, I administer an oath to you. And the bailiff said, Amen, thereby accepting the oath. And the witnesses testify about the bailiff that he consumed the deposit, that he must pay the principal if he admitted his own, on his own, of his own, that he had taken a false oath, that he must pay the principal and the additional one fifth payment. And bring a guilt offering, this indicates that one is required to pay monetary restitution for a deposit even after taking an oath. Rav Nachman said to him, With what are we dealing here? We are dealing with a case where one takes an oath outside of court, which does not exempt him from paying restitution. Rav Acha Barbin Yumi said to him, If so, say the latter clause of the Mishnah, if the owner asked the bailey, where is my deposit? And the bailey said to him, it was stolen. And the owner said, I administer an oath to you. And the bailey said, Amen, thereby accepting the oath. And the witnesses testified about the bailey that he stole it. He must pay the payment of double the principle. If he admitted on his own accord that he had taken a false oath, then he must pay the principle and the additional one-fifth payment and bring a guilt offering. And if it enters your mind that this oath was taken outside of court, is there an obligation of double payment in such a circumstance? If Nachman said to him, Rev Nachman said to him, I am able to answer you by saying that the first clause of the mission is referring to one who took an oath outside of court. And the latter clause of the mission is referring to one who took an oath in court. But we will not answer you with a forced answer. Instead, I will explain it in this manner. Both this clause and that clause are referring to an oath taken in court and it is not difficult here, the ruling of the first clause is with regard to one who leaped to take an oath as soon as the other litigant stated his claim, even though the court had not yet required him to do so, which is not considered a full-fledged oath. There, 
The ruling of the latter clause is with regard to one who did not leap, but took an oath only when required by the court. Rami Barhama said to Rav Nachman, after all, you do not hold in accordance with the statement of Rav. Why are you pledging yourself to explain this, the statement of Rav so that it not be contradicted by the Mishnah? Rav Nachman said to him, I said this not to justify Rav's ruling, but to clarify the statement of Rav, as Rav will explain the Mishnah in this matter, as I did. The Gemara asks, Okay, maybe we'll do part two over here. Part two. Yeah. 